There's a first question, Sonia, for you from uh, Zakaria. And he's saying in sustainable land management, there's often intense competition within agriculture, for instance, amongst livestock and crop farming. Um. Yes, well, I, I, can, I can respond to that, that um, there are many, many trade-offs in terms of what we are trying to do with climate smart agriculture. So, um, Zakaria gives the example of conservation agriculture, which conservation agriculture is one amongst many um, possible climate smart practices, and it involves no-till plus maintaining a, um, a, a cover um, of, of uh, the, the vegetative material on the soil. You don't remove that after harvest. And as he rightly points out, there, that is not possible in every situation because there's enormous competition for, for what those crop residues could be used for, for fuel, for feeding livestock, for many other uses. Now, these kinds of trade-offs come up again and again and again in climate smart agriculture. And I think the simple message is that in different farming systems, you would want to put a different end goal first. So in many, of, um, in many um, low income country and smallholder contexts, there would be a much stronger emphasis on um, increasing current livelihood outcomes, current household food security, and definitely at the, the expense of um, longer term mitigation. Um, whereas um, certainly in Denmark, where I live, almost all of the emphasis is, for example, on reducing the um, emissions from pig farming in particular. So I, I think it's just an, an, a, the, the key point is what you emphasize depends on the context of the farmers and the farming system. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's take another question. Um, there's uh, the same question as for Alexander. Um, what is the role of entrepreneurs or the private sector? Yes, that, that's, that's a great question, and I thought Alexander also made the very critical point that the entrepreneurs that we're talking about can range from uh, women uh, who are the traders and seeds at local food markets and, and operating on their own through to big companies. So there are many things here. Um, in the area of information systems, which I didn't address very strongly, we're seeing some really interesting practices in India, for example, where companies have business models where they provide farmers with free um, phone-based text messaging to inform them about what climate events are coming up. It helps them with planting dates and so on. And the way the company makes money is if the farmers want to follow up, they, they, there's a call-in help desk that they can use. That's one example. Um, again, another another situation is that is that many companies now are entrepreneurially providing weather insurance systems. Um, these have never previously been that affordable for small farmers in particular, but by using new mechanisms such as basing it on a weather index rather than on actual losses, um, actual losses reported by farmers, they're able to save transaction costs and therefore provide these products. So there is a huge range, I've just given you two there, but a huge range of entrepreneurial opportunities. And these are particularly open to, to national level um, companies and below, mm -hmm. lower levels. Yeah. yeah, thank you. There's a question from Natasha Grist, and uh, her question is supported uh, by other people. Um, she, you, you shared quite some examples, eh? and uh, she's asking, uh, are there some practices that are really very effective in terms of mitigation and food security and therefore should have a big focus? And uh, so which are the practices that are so effective that should receive yes. a lot of attention? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think there are, two, there are two approaches here. So. Um, one is, one is what Natasha is asking about. What are the big winners? What are the big winners at global level? And yeah. the other way of looking at it is that there aren't any particular big winners, but that what we need to do is look at the basket, the integrated basket of, of what needs to be done 
um, on a country by country or, or place by place level. So, so those, those are the two things, and I tend to go to the latter one, that rather than the big winners, let, let, let's look at a context and then decide from there. But having said that, um, I, I, think, I think some of the big winners that, that we do see in different regions, so in Asia it would be around rice management and reducing the, the methane emissions, and you can see that there's some very effective things to do there. For, for livestock, it will be a mixture of, of um, feed management and getting this kind of landscape balance right. I think in several continents, they're really big wins there. Um, the third one is a bit of a tough one. It's, it's about improving our um, the, the soil carbon and our management of that. I say that's a bit of a tougher one because what needs to be done differs a bit um, area by area. And the last one I'd like to draw attention to is breeding, um, breeding for future climates. And this needs to be done by farmers and scientists working together. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily require modern breeding method, methods, but it does require having a sense now of what likely climate futures are in different places so that we can start to think now about salinity tolerance or whatever else is needed.